Hey, Steve Mignani here doing the Junkyard Crawl at Bernardston Auto Wrecking with a 1964 Imperial Crown. Now, like me, this was built originally in 1964. I'm 58 years old and so is this car. I think it's aging better than I am, but I'll stop there with that stuff. Now, 1964 was an all new body designed by Elwood Engel, who was formerly with Lincoln. And in fact, in 1961, the Lincoln Continental, that beautiful austere study and taste, hit the world and shocked the rest of the luxury car field. So when Elwood Engel was hired by Chrysler in 62, his efforts appeared in 64. And this, if it's not a beautiful tribute to the Lincoln Continental, I don't know what is. In fact, if you look here, we'll see that 1960, 63's exaggerated tail standalone tailpipes or tail lamps and all that crazy stuff at the back was done away with. Uh, in fact, here at the back, Elwood Engel even referenced the 1956 and 57 Continental Mark II with this squared off tribute to a Continental kit. And again, Lincoln would revisit this in 1969 with the Continental Mark III. So Elwood brought a good bunch of Lincoln Continental II Imperial including this bogus squared off continental effect. Now in the back, we can see a nice big trunk. And being that this is an Imperial, it has cardboard modesty panels here covering uh, what would have been the voids in the back of the car to make them look a little more finished. Again, just cardboard, but with, this, with that said, the, uh, the effect, the idea was there. And in fact, there were 20,336 Imperial crowns built of which 14,181 were four doors like this. The others were two doors or convertible. So the vast majority were big four doors like this. Now getting back to Elwood Engel, this is Car Life magazine right here from July of 64. In fact, that's the, the month and year that I was built at the factory as it were. Big news this year, of course, was uh, the new uh, the Barracuda from Plymouth. And inside here is a road test of the Imperial Le Baron and has a stylish new look. And we can see that uh, the front of this, the, uh, the freestanding weirdo headlights of 63 were gone. And a lot of, I won't say taste, but just downtoning. It says here that uh, the torque flight of 64, the push button controlled, it can either hold each gear as the driver commands or shift up through all three forward speeds automatically. The automatic shifts take place under wide open throttle at 3600 to 3800 RPM per second and 38 to 4000 in third. But here's the thing. You can go full manual with these things. It's basically a max wedge transmission. It says your trial acceleration run showed that manually holding the shift points until the engine had reached 4,400 RPM produced the shortest elapsed times. And it says here, of course, the Imperial has a frame separate from the body, which was the case all the way through the 66 model year. And on the next page, a little more data on the car. And it's funny here, it says here, Imperial styling when it will inevitably be compared to that of the Lincoln Continental. And what is the harm in that? Hasn't the Continental achieved considerable acclaim as the best styled car of the era? The crisp rear fender peaks, the squared off roof and body lines, and the formal good looks of the Lincoln have permeated the entire industry. Yet the Imperial has its own distinctive features which set it off from the rest of the Continental, notably its divided grille, etc. These guys did not know that Elwood Engel designed them both. Sometimes magazines aren't fully in the loop. And speaking of that Continental, here it is. That's the car right there that Elwood Engel designed, came out in 61. And then here he is, what, three years later at uh, Imperial, cloning his own work a couple years later. So, but again, the whole thing about the 61 Continental was its flat looks, the slab sides, the blades, this stuff right here, which again, he brought to life right here on the Imperial. So again, this is a, a tribute, if you will, to the Continental. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, something interesting and kind of weird on this are the wheels. Now, if you know your Mopar muscle cars, 1970, the rally wheel came along 14 and 15 inch with these slots, but this ain't that. The one thing about Imperial, unlike Chrysler, is that this had a larger bolt pattern right here, a big bolt pattern. We'll get to that in just a second. And that second is right here. Now, this is a book. This is the story of Butch Leal. He's a buddy of mine, actually. I owe him a phone call. And Butch, of course, the California Flash, he autographed this for me. Good dude. And uh, Butch basically still is very much alive and well. But in 1965, Butch was one of the lucky ones who got an altered wheelbase Plymouth. And this is the early version of the car in blue. But see those wheels on the back? They're ugly. They're painted white. We can see it again on the right-hand side at the back of the car. Ugly, painted white. But again, look underneath the car right here. That's a Dana 60 rear axle. 
Butch Leal was a four-speed driver. Most of these funny cars from Chrysler, all 11 of them, for the most part, were automatics, with the exception of, I think, two or three, Butch Leal and Ronnie Sox. The eight and three-quarter Chrysler axle wasn't robust enough to last behind the four-speed and the race Hemi. So Chrysler played with the Dana 60 in the altered wheelbase cars in 65 before making them standard in 66 on four-speed street Hemis. Well, here's the thing. Chrysler didn't have a car Dana in 65, so they went to the Ford truck parts bin where a half-ton, heavy half-ton Ford truck could be had with a Dana 60 rear axle and the big five-on-five -five bolt pattern, which is to say that a B-body Mopar rear axle and a wheel would not have fit on Butch Leal's car, but Imperial wheels go right on the Ford pickup truck Dana rear axle, which is why we see Imperial wheels on the back of Butch Leal's car with that Dana rear axle. So a little weird piece of trivia from Funny Car Racing. And again, the Dana 60 proved itself very well in AFX racing and became standard stuff on four-speed Hemi cars from 66 onward. Now we know. And this one, of course, is a four-door hardtop. There were no sedans in Imperial land. And we see here on the base of the B-pillar, Crown. This is an Imperial Crown, not to be confused with a Crown Imperial, which was a hand-built limousine, of which maybe 20 were built in 1964. So the Imperial Crown was the, uh, the mass version. It was also a LeBaron, but this is the mass production version of which, like I say, there were 20,336 built in the Imperial Crown line. Now this one here, the front has been sliced off, probably to go into a, a man cave or a bar or something like that, but it gives us a nice look at the heavy gauge metal. Look how thick that metal is right there on the Imperial. Not, not light duty stuff you'd find on a Dodge Dart. So again, the Imperial was a more substantial car. Again, these were body on frame construction through 1966, while the rest of Chrysler cars were unit construction from 60 on. So, you know, Imperial was definitely a cut above, fighting with Cadillac. In fact, these are about 5,500 bucks or about $700 less than an Imperial, a Chrysler, sorry, these are $700 less than a Continental, which is to say that uh, Chrysler wanted to fight Continental and give you all the quality, but give you reasons to buy. In fact, 700 reasons to buy, it was cheaper. Here we have the standard one engine fits all. Here's the 413 with a single Carter AFB four barrel carburetor. This does have air conditioning. That wasn't standard, but that was one of the few things that was not standard equipment. Here's the AFB, 340 horsepower right here, the 413. And uh, we see this one has the clutch fan right here with steel blades, interestingly enough. The alternator in its third year in Chrysler vehicle 6234. And the nose of this one sliced off. But this one suffered a fire. We can see clearly the distributor caps burnt. Here's the insides of the spark plug wires right here. Something happened that ended this car's life. Uh, a thermal event, as they say, in engineering lands. Coming around this side, we can see the big drum brake. This is a 11-inch uh, drum right here, a huge thing, 11 by 3. Certainly enough brakes. No disc brakes on these until, I think, 66 as an option. But again... Uh, plenty of stopping power for this body on frame vehicle. Wrapped around windshield, similar to 1963, but again, the body with its slab side design uh, was, was standardized in 64 again and emulated the look of the uh, Lincoln Continental. If we look inside, we'll see those push buttons to the left of the steering wheel. And if you know your Max Wedge Mopars, 62, 63, and 64, the dial a wind push button torque flight, same thing here. And we saw it in that magazine where if you hold these things in gear, it goes up to 4,500, maybe 5,000 RPM. You get better acceleration rather than just leaving it in drive. It'll shift that way too, but you can punch them and lay rubber if you want to just as well. VIN is down there. We can see that the uh, 9 2 in the first two spots, that means Imperial Crown. Four, the third digits, 1964. Three is Jefferson Avenue assembly plant. And the remainder is the six digit sequence number. But again, 1964, first year for Elwood Engels. Well, replacement, I guess, of Virgil Exner's more flamboyant design sensibility. Sales were strong. Again, you know, over 22,000 of these puppies were sold in 1964. And, um, most of them, again, were four-door hardtops like this one here. Now, if you like this video, there's lots more interesting trivia from the world of automobiles and trucks and steam engines, you name it, uh, coming up soon. And be sure to subscribe to the channel and be sure to hit the like button, share this with your friends, and hit that bell so you're aware of the next video which comes out tomorrow morning.